uh, <coughs> that we are having today. Uh, without any further delay, can I check whether we do have uh, any apologies? Uh, good morning, honorable members, honorable minister, and our honorable guest. Chair, we received two apologies from Mr. Zungula and Mr. Lorima. They won't be able to join us in this meeting. Thank you, Chair. Okay, without any further delays, um, uh, I will be, I'll always be part of this meeting, but I think um, um, after this, I'll just have to attend to an urgent matter uh, that yesterday I lost my uncle, a younger brother to my father. So um, I will have to just clear attend after this meeting to the preparations for, for the funeral uh, that was still planning. But having said so, um, yes, thank you, Ari, for flagging the, the report, the, the agenda. First, let's, um, we'll be getting a briefing from the department as well as NNR and um, <coughs> NNR and uh, ESCOM on the long term, uh, uh, on the New Kupek nuclear plants long term operations or projections. Um, and uh, then uh, we'll have minutes. I'm not sure whether we will find time at, at what point to deal with the, the review or of the third, uh, of the second, as well as the third term program. Uh, I think we, we may have, even if we, if there are certain things that will have to be rectified, the committee can guide us to <clears throat> on, on, on rectifying such. Um, uh, it, it might be correct, it might be necessary just to get a test. If we agree, then it would mean that's what it will, it will be. But we may have to get some guidance or um, projections from the committee, especially in light of the too much open space uh, program on the third quarter. Uh, having said so, um, Honorable uh, Minister, can I give it to you? Um, and then after that, it's going to be the uh, NNR, and then uh, it will be ESCOM. Can I give it to you, Honorable Minister? No, thank you, thank you, uh, Honorable Chairperson, uh, Honorable Zippo, members of the Portfolio Committee, uh, Team TMRE. Uh, I can see that uh, the team from NNR is here. Uh, the ESCOM, and I can't see them on the list, but I hear that they are here. Uh, all of you. Uh, uh, the reality of the matter uh, is that we will allow the DG, and I assume going with the DG and Bambu to lead the presentation. But let me just explain that um, uh, the integrated resource plan that was approved in October 2019 that is IRP 2019, took a decision that the Cooper Power Plant design life must be extended by another 20 years by undertaking the necessary technical and regulatory work. That is the decision. Um, and therefore, uh, that decision is being implemented and executed. That is the report that you will receive today. And I'm sure the NNR, will uh, give you a, a report on the approvals they've given uh, to continue the license beyond the 40-year life. Uh, therefore, the long-term re uh, regulation on long-term operation, ESCOM is required to, to, to submit a safety case that justifies the safe operation of the plan for additional 20 years until 2024 for the first unit and 2045 and for the seventh unit. 
I think that is the, the introduction to the to, to the presentation, Honorable Chairperson. The fact that it was approved, IRP uh, committed in that uh, and gave the nuclear uh, national nuclear uh, regulator and ESCOM is involved. That is one area where we work together. We are not contesting each other. We are not tripping on each other. We work together. It is a necessary intervention to have that life extended. Uh, DG, DDG, if you are there, I'm handing over to you. Uh, thank you, Honorable Minister. Um, good morning to the Honorable Chairperson of the PPC and um, Honorable Members, um, the Minister, um, Chairpersons of um, NNR and ESCOM, um, ESCOM and NNR executives and um, their team members who are here, team DMRE. Um, honorable members and chairperson of the PPC, um, from the department, the minister has already uh, provided a background uh, uh, regarding um, the fact that the IRP 2019 had identified um, the extension of uh, Quebec uh, as one of the interventions that we have to undertake uh, to ensure security of supply um, in the in the long term, the the department role in the implementation of um, this uh, project uh, is in the main um, that of providing uh, oversight. The actual execution happens at ESCOM, and um, obviously um, there are. Uh, approve uh, regulatory approvals um, that um, are necessary uh, from a nuclear point of view as well as from a, um, a electricity industry or NASA's point of view from a licensing point of view. Um, DD Jimbambo will at a high level take uh, the members of the committee through a presentation um, to share from an oversight point of view the work um, that we're doing and the role that we play in this in this space. So with your permission, Honorable Minister, I will now hand over to Didi Jimbambo to take the members through uh, the department's uh, presentation. Didi Jimbambo. Thank you very much, uh, DJ. And uh, good morning uh, to the Honorable Minister, uh, the Chair of the Portfolio Committee and the members, and the Chair of uh, NNR and ESCOM, the team DMR and uh, all uh, protocols left. As the DG has uh, alluded, I will take the committee through at a high level on the role of the DMRE on the project. I will talk, uh, the purpose is of course, to brief the portfolio committee on the Kubert long-term operation. Then. Uh, also to request that the committee just to uh, note the progress update on the Kubert long-term operation. In terms of uh, the IRP, the minister has already alluded uh, to the policy decision that set out the direction that we had to follow in terms of uh, uh, the Kubert uh, long-term operation. Kubek has got two uh, operating units. Uh, they, it's got uh, the operating license that is valid uh, for 40 years uh, for each of these uh, two units, unit one and unit two. However, the approval by the National Nuclear Regulator is required to continue operations beyond the 40 year licensing period. Also, in terms of the regulations on the long-term operation, ESCOM is required to submit a safety case that justifies the safe operation of the plant for an additional 20 years until 2044 for unit one and uh, 2045 for unit two. 
the DMRE exercise the technical oversight to ensure the security of supply of uh, Quebec, as we've uh, already alluded to, that the IRP made an assumption that uh, the Quebec must operate beyond 2024 for an additional 20 years. So ESCOM then provides monthly progress updates uh, to the department so that uh, we can, as a department, ensure that we understand the, the progress on the project and uh, what are the key issues and what support is required for us to coordinate from a policy oversight perspective. We, we convene bilateral meetings on a quarterly basis with ESCOM with a view to understand the progress of the project and we provide the necessary support. And also we are responsible to ensure that we create an enabling policy environment for the project execution since we are the custodian of the energy policy. We continue engaging with uh, key stakeholders uh, where necessary that they provide their own uh, mandates to ensure that the success of the long-term operation is realized. We engage with the various uh, stakeholders, which include both local and international. In particular, we're a member state to the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IEA, and therefore we requested the IEA to support in terms of the safety aspects for the long-term operation, the SALTO mission, which was undertaken by ESCOM and they completed in March this year. Then the, 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 the Council for Geoscience is also an important stakeholder. We engage with the National Radioactive Waste Disposal Institute is also an important stakeholder and the, the National Nuclear Regulator. With all of this, uh, we need to uh, just uh, request that the committee should note that uh, Quebec is the most reliable plant within the ESCOM fleet and continue to stabilize the national electricity grid. With those words, I'd like to thank you. Honorable Minister and Chair President, that's the end of our presentation. As we had indicated, the details on the progress of the project will be provided by ESCO. We hand back to you. I thought the minister is still there. I don't want to expropriate the powers of the minister. No, in the in the program, uh, Chairperson, uh, you said we'll present then to be the NNR and then ESCOM. I thought that that was a directive. I will not jump in between them. Let them present. Okay, thank you, thank you, Honourable Minister. Can we give uh, ESCOM the, the platform? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honourable Chairperson. Um, le let me start off by firstly greeting you and uh, expressing our condolences to you and the Lucy Potlam on the bereavement that has befell you. Um, we, we wish you and the family strength. Uh, let me greet all the honorable members of the House, of this uh, honorable committee. Let me greet you, Honorable Nkwati, our honorable minister of DMRE. Let me greet uh, colleagues, uh, chair, leadership at NNR, uh, colleagues in DMRE, DG and uh, DDG and the teams. Um, from ESCOM, honorable Chairperson and uh, members, I'm accompanied by the acting group chief executive for in the interim, uh, Ms. Elsie Pule, our appointed acting uh, group chief executive, Caleb Kasim, is traveling in China with the Minister of Public Enterprises on the 
the matters that have been uh, articulated uh, in the public domain in terms of uh, some of the challenges we have uh, that need to be resolved uh, in China. Um, we also have with us in our delegation the newly appointed head of generations, Uzuide uh, Mr. Begingumalo, um, who assumed office uh, at the beginning of the month of April. And he has certainly got in and uh, dug his heels in uh, as the new leader of our generation's team. Also in the meeting from ESCOM is uh, colleagues from on the EXCO and uh, our nuclear scene manager of nuclear energy, uh, Sodika, who will also be leading parts of the presentation, and uh, colleagues from our other areas uh, in the business. Honorable Chair, we, as has already been articulated by the Honorable Minister and Honorable colleagues at uh, NNR, we have been on this journey of uh, the long-term uh, re 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 reapplication since 2010. Um, and we've been going through processes uh, where in 2019, we, we, we went through another process uh, that colleagues will uh, take us through in detail. But safe to say that uh, the general trend all over the world, even in the US, we see nuclear plants being extended to up to six years in some instances, uh, largely due to what has already been indicated that uh, well-maintained, well-managed nuclear is uh, a safe and also reliable source of energy that gives you energy that has low carbon footprint and uh, low emissions than uh, our traditional fleets uh, in the coal space. I will uh, hand over to the team to then take us through the, the route map of where we are, uh, where we're headed uh, on our path to June, uh, July 2024 which is the timeline at which we hope to have complied with some of the safety uh, compliance requirements that uh, colleagues mentioned earlier. And also hopefully at that point, we would have met uh, the requirements to, to have the restoration of uh, our LTO. Um, without much ado, Chairperson, with your permission, let me invite uh, the head of generations to then take us through the overall uh, remarks and he will then together with Ms. Pule uh, redirect uh, present us uh, on the various components of our presentation. Uh, with your permission I hand over to Mr. Numa. Thank you, sir. Good morning, uh, Honorable Minister. Just Honorable check your Chairman. audio. You're not that audible. Okay, uh, Honorable Chair, can you hear me now, Chair? From my side, it's clear. I don't know, Honorable Members and Honorable Lucy, but from my side, it's slightly clearer. You can continue, but there is a bit of an echo in the background. Uh, sir, we'll continue while we take the slides. Honorable Chair, I'm, I'm here at Quebec with uh, the acting CNO, uh, Mr. Sadiqa Tofi, who will be taking the committee through the ESCOM presentation. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, Sadiqa. Good morning, Honorable Chair, and to the members of the Portfolio Committee. Um, I'll take us through the briefing on the long-term operation and uh, save bandwidth and stop my video clear um, if that's okay to the honorable members. Um, going on to the, the presentation, if we, uh, I'll briefly just cover uh, the, what is long-term operation, the impact on this on, on, on ourselves, um, talk through with the current status, some of the key risks that we have, and then we can conclude in um, Chair. Um, in terms of long-term operation and um, what we are working on, 
on the next slide. The business case that we have submitted and approved by the board in uh, the year 2010, um, August, um, was to integrate all the known and anticipated technical and economic aspects of, of extending the life of Uber from 40 to 60 years. Um, and this was done um, to ensure that the strategy maintains a high level of nuclear safety coupled couple with acceptable performance, determining the optimum operational life of the power station, um, and confirming an asset management strategy to support Kuburg um, for, for the most optimum operational life um, that we have. Um, the project in the business case identified opportunities to optimize the generation capacity of the plant and to support these initiatives where economic viability is demonstrated. Um, and key to this was the replacement of steam of the steam generators and other replacement components that have been specified to give ESCOM the opportunity to increase Kubik's output with an additional 10% at the later stage, um, which will be the next project that we will launch shortly after. Um, ultimately, the idea is to provide ESCOM a low-cost carbon, carbon generation opportunity for an additional 20 years of operation. Uh, and brief chair, that was the summarized version of the business case. Um, in terms of the strategy overview, um, worldwide, as the, the Honorable Chair of ESCOM has alluded to, um, there is a trend amongst nuclear operators to opt for life extension in lieu of new generation capacity, uh, since the additional costs associated with life extension far outweigh the economic benefits um, that, uh, that, that are to be achieved. Um, and most plants in the USA have already uh, have successfully applied for 60 operating licenses. And some um, have actually extended the operating plants by to 80 years. So that's an additional or doubling of the original uh, design life. Uh, the French fleet is also following a 60 year life strategy for, for similar units to the, the Kuba um, plant. Uh, the life extension project initiative started in 2007 and we obtained formal approval of the strategy in 2010. The time frame is comparable with similar projects in the industry. Um, we have kept all stakeholders like the DPE, the DOE and RDMRE and in, and then are informed of the life extension strategy from 2010 onwards uh, via the various uh, licensing workshops, import permits and PFM applications that were submitted at the time so to the various stakeholders. In line with the routine asset management and operating uh, strategy for the power station, um, we replaced uh, so, some major equipment, including the low pressure turbines, the generator status, the generator transformers, um, which were due for the replacement uh, for the facilities to, to, to support us with the life extension. We did identify three life limiting components that we needed to replace for allowing us to enter into long term operation. And these are the steam generators on, on, on both units, the refilling water storage tanks, as well as the reactor pressure vessel heads um, that required replacement. Um, the refilling water storage tanks and the reactor pressure vessel heads has been replaced uh, with the last unit two reactor head replaced last outage on unit two. Uh, and we're currently busy with the installation of uh, additional new steam generators on unit one. Um, and later on in the year with the start of the unit two outage, we will replace the last three on unit two um, coming up in this year. When we benchmark this against other comparable utilities and the work that we've done, we have not identified any prohibitive technical challenges uh, that would preclude um, Kuburg from attaining uh, an extension up to 60 years. Um, we have the confidence that the timelines will be met. Um, we have the resources that has been provided to implement the remainder of the projects and the commitments made in the Altio safety case um, that has been submitted to the National Nuclear Regulator in accordance with the, uh, next, uh, the requirements laid out by the regulator. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of the timeline and history, um, as I've mentioned, the feasibility study started in 2007, uh, and we did consider all the uh, technical assessments uh, and licensing issues, as well as economic aspects. We obtained the board approval for the strategy and informed the NNR accordingly of our intention to enter into long-term operation. This gave us the green light um, to pursue the steam generator replacement project. Um, uh, and uh, this was seen as a major prerequisite for LTO. It was not in uh, a requirement for continued operation at the time. In 2012, however, um, the HG replacement project um, was stopped um, and the whole process restarted. Uh, we needed a new contract to be signed in 2014 and installation plan for the outages was scheduled for 2018. 
uh, and implementation was subsequently moved to RTGIS 125 and 225, um, starting in the year 2021. I have a duty manufacturing defects uh, on the forgings of the steam generator. We had to focus on the quality and nuclear safety issues um, around that. And implementation was uh, later deferred to RTGIS 126 and 226 um, due to a number of challenges on the part of ESCOM and the contractor at the time. Um, a key item for L2O was the absence of regu uh, regulatory framework around 2015. We did develop something um, in consultation with the regulator and follow the uh, IAEA SALTA methodology um, and in fact implemented uh, our, our first IAEA SALTA um, mission in 2015 and to gain support from the IA on the mission um, was held in that year. However, in 2019, NNR issued variation 19 to the nuclear installation license and introduced a single date um, by which operation must end unless the license is varied. Uh, we have approached regulator requesting a specific end date um, to be included for unit two as it was commissioned uh, a year later under unit one and will achieve its 40 years of operation in, by the end of 2025 or November 2025. Um, the NNR also published regulations in 2019 um, through RG27 and RG28, which were the regulations around long-term operation uh, and the periodic safety review. And, and these were specific for us that we needed to revise our plans to make sure that we meet the requirements as laid out by the regulator for entering into uh, the long-term operation. And the project was the baseline to these new requirements. Um, so we consequently updated the scope in the project plan uh, to meet all the above requirements in, in driving the HGR project. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of LTO, what is LTO? The regional, um, in, in brief, um, it basically means that the regional plan was designed and took into account and assumed 40 years of uh, operation of the facility. Uh, this does not mean that the plant can only operate for 40 years. It does mean that uh, the design aging assessments needs to be updated to take into account any additional period of, of, of operating that would be required by the uh, operator as ourselves. Um, and during uh, 2019, when NNR published the new regulation, we and changed the license um, to be valid for operational crew work until 21 July 2024. Um, and I specifically requested that um, the license be amended uh, for subsequent licensing stages for long term operation. Uh, or unless it's varied, suspended or revoked in terms of the requirements to operate the plant. Um, this data 40 years is, is after the date that Unit 1 entered into commercial operation. Um, and as I've mentioned before, Unit 2 entered commercial operation on the 9th of November of the following year. And we have requested that the license be changed to reflect a separate date for Unit 2. Uh, however, the onus for LTO is on ESCOM to demonstrate to the regulator that the safety of the plant can be demonstrated for the period of long-term operation. And that needs to be requested through the formal licensing application that we have submitted to the NNR. The next slide, please. Uh, this slide is, is, is quite a busy slide, um, but I'll try and just break, break it down uh, um, quickly for ease of reference. Um, what is expected is that uh, there's two portions to it. The original assumption of 40 years of operation of the plant, as mentioned, um, Unit 1 started in 1984, and uh, we are expecting to receive NNR approval in 2024 for the LTO program. Um, and business as usual for us has been normally fueling outages, maintenance plans, design improvements, and modifications for safety reasons um, that we've done. We've replaced the turbine, upgraded many control systems, um, uh, the essential piping uh, that we needed to, to run the business as per normal. And the introduction of the LTO program needed, needed us to just review the plant and the systems and structures to make sure we are able to go into an, an, an LTO period um, after extensively understanding the condition of the plant and the, meeting the regulatory requirements. Um, and the program required us to understand and map the approach of, of the requirements from for, for the new license extension to review the safety of the plant against local and international regulatory requirements and identify any gaps. And this we, we had done um, and completed uh, the required projects and activities that's needed to enter into LTO. There's also other work in terms of the aging mechanism applications that we needed to understand and make sure that that work is well understood and acceptable in terms of uh, long-term operation and to identify any projects that's needed um, to support the license application. Um, then that basically translates into two streams of work. There are certain activities that needs to be completed prior to entering into LTO, 
Um, and those are the commitments that we have submitted to the regulator to meet in terms of our commitments for, for LTO. And the other work that we will be doing during the LTO period to support the life of, of the plant during uh, the subsequent 20 years after we have the, received the necessary uh, approval to operate. And those modifications and work in terms of the plant safety regulations will be managed and controlled accordingly um, and become the new business as usual um, after that period. Next slide, please. This slide just provides a high level overview um, of different pictorial around um, what it means. And it puts together all the different requirements of what was taken into account to, to provide the, the safety case to the regulator in June of last year. And basically it, it encapsulates all the requirements from the regulator in terms of the regulatory guides, um, 27 and 28 for ALTO and PSR. Um, the SALTA requirements and SALTA studies and aging assessments that was conducted under uh, the SALTA mission. Uh, it's also looking at the suitability of the site to house the facility and any improvements that is required through the Dana-Fund Site Safety Report. Um, that fed into the work for the uh, periodic safety review that has been con conducted and uh, the large part of the modifications such as the HGR and other plant improvements that's required also went into the analysis um, to determine uh, what is required for the safety case. That was submitted to the NNR, the NNR and, the, and the information contained within that, uh, as well as uh, granted us the required permission to do a lot of the additional work that is required while the regulatory review is underway. And that's a period that we can now. We are expecting to tender the, the regulatory approval around about uh, 20, 20, June 2024. But in terms of the safety case that has been submitted to the regulator, we are currently in the regulatory review period and we are working with the regulator to address any comments that uh, will arise from, from the review to make sure that uh, we are able to address uh, any of those concerns that the regulator might identify and to meet um, the requirements um, as laid out in terms of the regulation. Next slide, please. The next slide just provides a, an, an update on just the different elements of the, and the suite of documents that has been taken into account into the licensing safety case. Um, the periodic safety review, um, as I mentioned, these are based on the regulations of uh, March 28, and it provides assurance that the plant status is acceptable when compared against the current safety requirements, both nationally and internationally. Um, it provides assurance that the plant is safe to continue to operate until the next review period, which is normally in 10 year intervals, and subject to addressing any, any deviations um, that they may have been identified through the uh, non standards that the plant is being compared to. The safety aspects for long-term operation or SALTO um, assesses Kubrick's aging management processes. And these results are used to drive improvements to demonstrate Kubrick is suited for an additional 60, for, for an additional 20 years of operation and taking us up to a 60 year life. Part of this process uh, identifies um, different system structures and components um, that are important for the plant uh, and nuclear safety and includes the design life and limits of these components that needs to be evaluated, assessed and through a rigorous safety analysis process and to determine its suitability for extended operation. The outcome of these analysis results in uh, required plant upgrades or updated services or maintenance plans and inspections that need to be conducted to assure us that the plant aging assessments are suitable for that. The Dandefin Saint safety, safety Report really assesses the magnitude uh, and occurrence probability of external events such as a seismic event or a tsunami hazard um, to assess the suitability of the site to withstand that and, it, and propose any additions to the plant to mitigate against the, uh, those assets. A key part of the report as well looks at the security and public exposure risks and characteristics um, that need, we need to take into account and that could pose an impediment to the development and execution of emergency preparedness and evacuation uh, response actions that's required on that. And that's where the Jennifer Tensart Safety Report features into that. The next slide talks to the safety case. Um, and this uh, really is the collection of all the information um, up front um, that's put together to substantiate the safety of the plant. 
um, and activity of, for operation and any modifications that, that would be required. It provides the overall justification for continued safe operation and a commitment to the NNR on the extent to which the current licensing basis remains valid. Um, that's the important document um, that the NNR uses um, and provides us really the, 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 the safety arguments going forward. We've also been directed to develop the public information document, and this provides members of the public with sufficient information on, on the ESCOM application that has been sent to the NNR for a variation to the neutral license to operate to work beyond 2024 for an additional 20 years. Um, and in addition to these documents, there's also been the nuclear security review, which conducts an overall security assessment uh, of covert security provisions, both physical and cyber, and really confirms our compliance with national regulations and through conformance to international nuclear safety standards and security standards. Uh, it assesses covert security provisions in the context of aging management and long-term operation as well, and uh, identifies any deviations from these regulations um, that we would need to address if any has been identified and that will be dealt with in the relevant processes associated with that. Okay, the next slide will go through the criteria for the safety case. Um, and the uh, safety case was required to demonstrate compliance with the relevant regulatory safety criteria and requirements, both nationally and internationally. And, Based application of the results of the safety analysis with consideration of the aging of the system structures and components that we see. It provides an overall assessment of the safety of the installation and justification for continued safe operation and demonstrate the availability of the financial and human resources as required for operating the plant in the uh, long term operation period. And the safety case important includes the necessary safety improvements in the application that's required, including any refurbishment or the provision of additional system structures or components um, and additional safety analysis and engineering justifications required to ensure that the licensing basis remains valid during the LTO period. Next slide, please. In terms of the current status, where we are in, in, in pulling all of this work together, um, we have to report that uh, the safety at the aspects of long term operation of SALTER, those aging management assessments, has been completed and submitted to the NNR um, for review. Um, the execution of outstanding aging analysis are in progress and that is progressing according to the schedule that we do have. The periodic safety review, all those activities um, have been completed and submitted to the NNR. Uh, the safety case compilation has been completed and submitted to the NNR. Uh, the LTO public information document has been submitted to the NNR and has been publicized in the uh, various media that we were required to, including public libraries and municipalities. Uh, the nuclear security review documentation has also been submitted to the regulator. Uh, the activities that we now need to perform and while well, that review is ongoing is uh, we've also done an independent review on the SALTA work by the International Energy, Atomic Energy Agency and to provide us uh, a different review on uh, the work we've done. Uh, some of the major projects needed, that's needed to address the aging issues, um, as I previously mentioned, the steam generator replacement that's currently scheduled for this year for, for, both, unit, for, for unit, both units. Uh, PTR refueling water storage tanks, those have been completed on both units, as well as the replacement of the reactor basin heads. Um, in terms of the benefit and safety report, this work is in progress and on track um, to meet the commitments that we've made and the implementation of the aging ass assessment um, actions as well as new management programs um, is being pro progressed and is on track in terms of the committed um, schedule that we do have in those. Other plant and arts are in progress and on track for completion with constant monitoring of the critical path activities. And this is being addressed in different fora on site and reported through the through to the various stakeholders, uh, as, it, as alluded to by Mr. Bumbo. Um, next slide, please. Am I the window? I look here. Yeah, Sadika's gone silent. Sadika? Yes, Chair. Now, can you hear me? Yes. 
Uh, just on, I guess the next slide is just providing pictures on the actual refilling water storage tank and the, ref and the vessel head um, that we've replaced. Um, in terms of the, the, the steam generator replacement that is currently on, um, you know, on slide 16. Um, mm, please check the consistency of your sound, Sadika, please. Thank you. I'm now on slide 16. Can everybody hear me clearly? As I mentioned, Artage 126 commenced on the 10th of December, and this is the significant Artage because it is the displacement of the steam generators on uh, Unit 1. Um, in terms of alignment of the project with the Kubik Artage organization and integration of the project within the station schedule was completed successfully. Our uh, schedule adherence has been a challenge for us due to numerous reasons, such as uh, the recording stopped, resource utilization, the safety incidents, and physical interferences that were not anticipated, um, as well as uh, challenges in obtaining visas for the foreign delegates that was doing some of the work. We had some plant failures and train failures that we needed to address, um, and uh, have experienced a delay, which is around recording in progress. And this delay has an impact on the availability of energy, but there's no direct impact on the LTO project per se. The project team leadership has restructured <clears throat> and, and has facilitated improved communication and interchanges on the project. However, what we have experienced is behavior of the contractor in pursuit of additional compensation events has remained unchanged um, and all the large awards, um, both in Italian time made by adjudicators in the dispute process that have so far been tabled for formal arbitration. Uh, the arbitration is a lengthy and legal process. We will determine the final liability of each party associated with that. To the extent, um, I think it may just be important for the committee to note that to date we are dealing with 416 compensation events. Of that, 138 are in disputes and we are currently managing 17 arbitrations, um, including a high court appeal associated with this. So that is keeping the teams quite busy. What we have done in terms of uh, the work has uh, the implement of additional project scheduling cost controls. We have appointed train specialists to support us in the contract management and commercial resources that have initiatives have proven to be effective in stemming the side of just managing uh, the supplier in providing us a successful project. All project facilities have been provided um, for use prior to the required date, including the nuclear licensing of the regional steam generator interim storage facility, and that is in use now with the old steam generators replaced. Technical risk has been identified during the previous outages, such as the presence of asbestos and lead inside containment, were mitigated early um, by implementation of action plans and removing these as a sh on the schedule um, as early as possible and mitigating safety threats. Uh, the operating experience that we've gained from the, this outage will be taken into account in the planning of the next outage um, that the team will work through. The next slide, please. In terms of steam generator, um, we have to report that the original steam generators on Unit 1 have all been removed from the after building and are being stored in the designated old steam generator interim storage facility on site. Uh, the actual radiation um, measurements that has been taken outside of the facility is below the predicted measurements that was used during the licensing process uh, and of, of the building. So we are quite happy with the performance of the, of, of the plant in that regard. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the three replacement steam generators um, have been introduced into the containment building. Um, and put into position and the welding on the primary circuit of these components has been completed. We're currently busy with the welding on the secondary side um, of that. Um, I'm on slide 17. As of the 1st of May, the primary system welds on all three steam generators have been completed and primary pipe and camping tools and, and beveling are being prepared for for those installations. Multiple streams of work, such as installation of the additional auxiliary piping to the replacement steam generators, installation of the operational platforms are in progress to restore the plant. Um, 
uh, with the primary focus currently being on connecting and welding in the secondary feed water and steam lines um, on that. The station artich workshop inside from build, inside containment building will follow on from this, and we have tried to optimize as far as possible the work of what can be done in parallel with the main works. The next slide, 18, just provides a view on the, the, the size of the old steam generators as we remove them from uh, the containment structure. That would be slide 18, 18. Um, and slide 19 provides the view of the, uh, of, of the steam generator being moved into the old interim storage uh, facility uh, moving out. The following two slides on pictures on slide 20 provides you um, a view around the new steam generators being installed in the plant. Um, and <clears throat> just before we had welded them into position, and that just gives uh, an indication of the enormity of the plant. In terms of risks for the for the program, which, um, I've, I've lost the presentation. The current risk that we do have, um, the major LTO commitments are on track, um, but individually, we are monitoring all of these acti activities quite critically, um, including the critical path uh, of each to enable risk to be easily uh, identified and to enable us to mitigate any actions to be developed. And these are reported on through various work streams um, up in, in the organization, including through to the regulator and the uh, DMRE in the re regular engagement sessions we have with us on slide 22. Um, the main risk that we do face is associated with completing the large scope of, of work um, prior to the LTO start date. There are currently no technical challenges um, and activities are being closely project managed to ensure that we do keep uh, on track of all the activities that we have and mitigating the work as early as possible and communicating those appropriately. Uh, not all the actions will be completed prior to LTO, and these will become commitments for completion during the LTO period in accordance with the regulations that we do have. Uh, the Unit 1 outage 127 has been scheduled to start on the 24th of, the, of July 2024, which provides some additional time for the NNR to complete their reviews as the issuing of the LTO license for Unit 1 is technically needed to allow us uh, for fuel to be reintroduced into the reactor after this outage and start of the plant. Um, the challenge for us still remains in ensuring that we do get the license change request for the end date of Unit 2 um, to, to secure us with the security supply of, uh, along the operation of uh, Unit 2 in terms of its normal 40 operating life. In conclusion, Chair, from the work that we've done on the safety assessments and the safety case submitted to the regulator, we have not identified any uh, technical items that will, we believe will preclude us from uh, entering into long-term operation of the plant beyond the current established timeframes. Uh, the alter activities are moving on according to plan, um, and we are being closely monitored to ensure that any slippage could, that would impact the issuing of the required line license is appropriately managed and mitigated and, and developed. Uh, the public information document and reactive services have been published to inform the public on the safety of LTO and the ESCOM approach and we will be embarking on further media campaigns to support that information. Uh, we have submitted the safety case to the regulator within the prescribed time limits uh, to afford in and our sufficient time for, for its review. Uh, there are some outstanding commitments that we need to complete prior to entering into LTO, and these are being managed as previously mentioned through the appropriate um, fora. Um, the NNR will lead the public engagement uh, process concerning public LTO, and we will support the NNR in uh, that initiative. ESCOM understands that the extension of approval is not guaranteed, but it is a prerogative of the NNR um, for us. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Sadika. Um, and I think now from our side uh, as Team ESCOM, uh, we are concluded. May I then perhaps revert back to our Honourable Minister and the DMRE team and the NNR team, uh, and perhaps Honourable Minister will thereafter then revert back to you, Honourable Chair Luzib. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, NNR, can we give you a space? Uh, 
Thank you. My name is Tapelo Mutsudi. I'm the chairperson of the NNR. I'm accompanied by the CEO, Ms. Ditebo Komo, and she's with her executive team, one of whom is the responsible manager for the LTO, Mr. Phillips. He'll be the one giving us the more detailed presentation on the evolution of events since ESCOM submitted an intention to extend the life of Quebec. We did receive the safety case last year in 2022 in July, and um, it takes two years, 24 months to review the application. It is worth, how, you know, what's stating though that this is an interactive process. So the minute we receive the safety case, then pending initial review, there'll be further requests for information. Um, there'll be points of clarification that will be highlighted and uh, the extent to which the process can be completed on time is contingent on how speedily the applicant can respond to the inquiries that are arising from the regulator side and so whereas under normal circumstances the prescribed time frame is 24 months in line with best practice globally you know um, things do happen uh, for example we can already see that there's a delay in the SGR replacements and it is not improbable that some of those activities, you know, might, uh, it might not be possible to defer them to post um, the awarding of the, of the extension. And so, you know, you know there'll be continuous engagements between ourselves and ESCOM over the, over the next few months. We are reliant on, obviously, our internal resources to carry out this process. However, naturally, it will not be possible for us to have all the resources that we require, particularly because this is quite a new exercise on the part of the NNR. We only have one nuclear power station in South Africa. And therefore, there is no prior experience, at least in as far as we are concerned. However, by virtue of us being a signatory and a member of the IAEA, we benefit from the expertise of our global partners who have done this before. And um, ESCOM did allude to this point earlier that many countries have extended the life of their plans over over the last few years and therefore there is some knowledge that exists out there on how to do this and do it safely but not only that we also have access to technical support organizations which we refer to as tso's or consultants uh, that we draw on occasionally particularly in those areas that you know we don't routinely employ uh, uh, you know there's certain services that any organization will not um, employ on a daily basis, but will occasionally require. And in that context, we will then source uh, consultants to assist us in that regard. I will hand over to Dite Bojo, the CEO, and uh, she will then introduce the senior manager who will be responsible for giving us a more detailed presentation on, on the LTO regulatory process. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Good morning. Um, so, Chairperson of the Portfolio Committee, good morning, Honorable Members and Honorable Minister. All protocol observed. I will not take up too much time. As the Chairperson says, we have with us um, the executive responsible for regulatory oversight of the power plant, uh, Mr. Orion Phillips, and he will take us through the presentation. Opie? Good morning, everybody. Greetings to the Honorable Minister, greetings to the Chair of Portfolio, greetings to the members of the Portfolio Committee and to the DG and the Chairpersons and Honorable Members and all protocol observed. Please uh, provide the presentation. I hope you have it. We are ready to present. We've given you uh, co-hosting rights, Mr. Phillips, to you okay. and me. Okay, let me just get all of the presentation. Can you see the presentation? Uh, yes, we can yes. see it, right? Yes. Okay. Please if you can just put it. Yeah, if you can just put it on present on um, presenter mode. Yes, we're doing that. Okay. Is it visible now? Actually, maybe not presenter mode, but on presentation mode. <laughs> yes, presentation mode, uh, Chairperson. 
So uh, no, if if you can. Wait, on wait. my side, it's on presentation. Allow him to present. If we are all stamping in the presentation, it won't be there. Please. Okay. Can I go ahead with the presentation? Yes. Thank, Can thank I, you, the only thing, sorry, the only thing here yeah, that I look at, I don't think the presentation is not there. The presentation is there. What is um, improbably is an enlargement of the screen. So you can proceed to answer. Uh, we will see how the screen is solved to maybe it's, it's the manner in which you structured your. I want to see when you proceed whether the screen or it won't be full on the screen. Okay. So on on the my side, I put it in presentation mode, sir. It could Don't be. Worry, it's there. It's there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, honorable members and uh, all protocol observed, this is the contents of the presentation. Um, we'll just give a brief overview of the scope of the, the regulator. I think um, that it should be known. It's our mandate to look at the safety of nuclear installations and the general over, uh, approach to LTO. And uh, as previously mentioned, we consider international experience. And then we look at the project phases. And then we look at some technical issues associated with the, with the safety assessment. We can skip these slides because these slides essentially um, speak to the mandate of the NNR. This is a geographical slide. This is pictures of facilities. And here we essentially see the, 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 the understanding we have of long-term operation. That has previously been mentioned, but we do need to mention that we need to justify by means of a safety assessment because of the degradation of the systems and the features of these systems as, as they degrade over time. Plant life extension involves replacement, maintenance, and modification to major systems. And as we have mentioned previously, it's normally approved for a 20 year period. The slide talks about international experience. We can see um, in the national arena, um, countries like the US and, and South, South Korea have a license renewal um, um, process, and they also extend to 20 years. That has been mentioned before. Um, France has a slightly different way of going about it. They have a 10 yearly periodic safety review. In South Africa, we have a hybrid. And um, South Africa has quite stringent measures to ensure that a plant can operate in excess of 40 years. Just a, a brief one on the periodic safety review. It compares the operating plant against modern codes and standards for the purpose of identifying opportunities to enhance nuclear safety. The timeline or the approach, uh, the null, Zero one was issued in 1976. Alt, uh, ESCOM's uh, strategy was received in 2010. We reviewed the strategy as the regulator. Um, the SGR project started in 2014, 2015. We also issued a regulatory guidance in March, 2019. And um, there was an official notification of intention of LTO uh, in May 2020. And as previously mentioned, we received the safety case in July 2022. And very recently, we have received public comment um, mid March 2023. The project phases um, that we have um, employed to manage it as a project from a regulatory point of view, um, we commenced with uh, preparing the regulatory framework. Uh, then we went into a preparatory phase, looking at the application. Uh, we now have done a preliminary review of the safety case, and we are in the process of developing a draft safety evaluation report. Later, uh, towards the end of the project, as mentioned previously, there will be public consultation. Once there's public consultation and we've put all this information together with the 
technical review that we've done, we will then present this to our board, the NNR board, and the board will then make a decision, yay or nay, or on the uh, LTO project. The regulatory documents that we've developed, we've developed a regulation R226, and this was issued in March 2021. And this establishes requirements for long-term operation. The other documentation are essentially uh, guidance documents to provide the operator, ESCOM, with a more detailed information on how to comply with the regulation. The expert missions that have been conducted uh, with our international counterparts, we have had a meeting with the USNRC to um, gain understanding of how they license um, their, their, their plants. Also with the French, uh, ASN French, we have looked at their systems and their methods for licensing um, nuclear plants in excess of 40 years. So we have had these missions and we've learned a lot from these missions. When we come to the aging management side of things, it means ensuring availability and ensuring that the safety functions are op operating for the service life of the plant and also taking into account the possible aging effects. And these aging effects are on the structure systems and components. And, um, to ensure that the performance characteristics are, are good in a safety point of view. These are just the, uh, the technical side of aging management, looking at the principal three areas, civil, electrical, and mechanical. And there we've listed the components of interest that would be subject to aging and degradation. The safety assessment part is the very essential part that the National Nuclear Regulator looks at. It involves scoping of systems, structures, and components, and then adopting a suitable methodology and looking at what, all at the affected aging mechanisms for these um, system structures and components. We also include the, the South Emission findings. Uh, we look at them very carefully. And we make sure that um, these have been addressed by the operator, as well as the safety case. Now, the safety case is an important uh, document because it sets out, it brings everything together in terms of the, the, the regulation, um, the safety arguments, um, the standards that have been used, the technical verification that needs to be done, the engineering um, analysis that, that was undertaken, and also um, the need for inspection. So this is a key document, which the NNR reviews. Um, it does take a, a while to review it. We have to cross-reference. We have to look at our standards. We've developed a technical assessment guide that gives our staff uh, insight into what to look at when we review the safety case. It includes technical areas like um, defense in depth, looking at the reliability of the safety function, and looking at issues like radiation protection. So that, this is the essential um, document that we use to determine the safety of, of the facility going forward. Then we also have the periodic safety review. I've explained that earlier what it does. It is 14 factors, and the 14 factors are detailed factors looking at the, at the plant and the, the ability of the plant to operate in excess of 40 years. This is just bringing together everything, the safety case elements, uh, the modifications that have previously been mentioned, um, the vessel head, the SGR, the Fukushima mods, and then the management programs, and then also some detailed calculations that need to be done, the time-limited aging analysis calculations that's done on various components to ensure that these components um, um, can operate in excess of 40 years. This is the review schedule that the NNR has, has worked towards. Um, the first three steps have been completed. Um, there was a notification where the uh, ESCOM applied for the license. Um, they submitted the safety case. Now, uh, point four, we are now in the process of drafting a preliminary re report 
that will be provided to the NNR board. Then we have a public participation which is planned for January 2024. We are in the process of developing a plan and we will roll that plan out ASAP. Um, then the recommendation goes to the board in March 24 next year. Hasn't commenced because we are putting together all the information in terms of any um, concerns that may come from members of the public together with our technical review that we're doing on the safety case. Then the final step is um, step seven, July 2024. At that stage, um, the NNR will be in a position to make an announcement on its decision regarding LTO. Then lastly, this is my last slide. Um, we have in our preliminary review identified some technical issues that need to be resolved. However, the NNR tracks and monitors basis to ensure proactive resolution of any emerging issues on the safety case. So we hands-on, we have workshops, we communicate our issues uh, with uh, the operator ESCOM. We also have adopted a risk management approach to mitigate any issues which require intervention. And this is also part of ensuring that decisions are made in a timely manner. The NNR also highlights these issues to the applicant. And if necessary, if we see a major issue that we feel or that we've assessed to be a, a, a showstopper, if you like, we will um, escalate this issue to our executive authority. Then lastly, um, because uh, the, it's a very dynamic uh, project and um, we have a lot of interactions with, the, with ESCOM as our chairperson has indicated, um, we have determined that by January this coming year, we will be in a better position just to make a call on the outcomes of what we've reviewed and what have emerged in the safety case. Thank you, honorable members. Thank you, DG. Thank you, chairperson of the portfolio committee. Thank you, chairperson, for um, listening to this presentation. I am, am done with the presentation. Thank you. Okay. What is the net uh, total of the presentation, Honorable Chairperson? I'm handing over to you now. Um, thank you, Honorable Minister, your your team, and uh, NNR as well as um, uh, ESCOM uh, with the, the presentations. Honorable members, I'm not gonna. You know me. Um, I'm not gonna channel you, but please uh, state where your questions are directed to. Uh, on the uh, chair of uh, ESCOM, I know sometimes we've got different styles of chairing in parliament, but um, the common one that we use here, you, you will just take a pen in the paper, take questions that are directed to you as ESCOM and um, the rest, including the minister, as well as the, uh, the department and NNR, you, you will do the same. Can I then take hands of honorable members? Just state where each one is directed to. Oh, Ish, I made the mistake. Um, welcome, uh, honorable uh, Graham Mare. Um, there's an alternate from the, the DA. Welcome to this portfolio committee. Um, yeah, welcome. I, I did not notice when the meeting started, but uh, it has been brought to my attention. Thank you for, for, for that intervention. Um, I'd seen a long lost friend of ours, uh, uh, Honorable Nyonzo, the president. I don't know whether he's still here or he has disappeared again. Uh, but uh, welcome. Um, can I take the hands? I see first the hands of um, Honorable Mailem, the hand of uh, Honorable Mare, 
Claire Marie, is there any other hand? I'm gonna have a very short meeting. Uh, Honorable Matogwe. Okay, going one, two, three. Let's do it like this. I'll give Honorable Mailem, then Honorable Matogwe, then Honorable Graham Marie. You can come, Honorable Mailem. Uh, no audio on mute. Chair, let me start by offering you condolences on the passing of your father. Um, and uh, I, I'm ser seriously saddened by that loss. Uh, Chair, if I could move on to the minister. Uh, minister, you made a commitment that the updated integrated resource plan would be published at the end of March 2023. We're now in mid-May. So my question is, when will the updated IRP be publicized and what's going on with that? Uh, Chair, you did ask that we address our questions to specific people, but it's a bit difficult when, when, when the questions kind of cross between ESCOM and NNR. So I'm gonna try and start with, with ESCOM um, and then go to NNR, but some of the questions apply to both. So my first question is, what is the exact status of the safety case as at the moment? Where is it in the process? Has it been finalized? Has it been submitted? Is it under review? What is, what is the status of the safety case? My second question relates to the cost of the, the, the life extension project. In 2010, the business case estimated that it would cost 20 billion rand. In a parliamentary question in December, 2022, Minister Gordon indicated that it would cost uh, approximately 21 billion rand. But in a presentation to Parliament last year, it was indicated to ESCOM that it would be significantly higher. So my question is very simple. What is the estimated or budgeted cost of the, the life extension project at Kuburg? We also heard that there are going to be additional delays and um, currently that's running to 45 days. My question is, what impact will that have on the license expiry deadline of 21 July 2024 uh, or on the granting of a new operating license? And I think that should probably go to the NNR. With regard to the license uh, and again to the NNR, what is the status of the specific end date request regarding unit two? Is that something you are considering? Is it something that is likely? What, what's going on there? Currently, we have a site license for Kuburg, and there's a proposal, as I understand it, from ESCOM that it be split into unit-specific licenses. Uh, is there any update on that, and does that impact the specific end date request? My next question is, is 2045 a hard decommissioning date for Kuburg? Is that when we are going to stop operations at Kuburg completely? Following on to that, what plans are in place for decommissioning and waste disposal of high level waste if the long term operation license extension is not granted? In other words, if, if the NNR for whatever reason says, well, you know what, you haven't met the, the standards that we require ESCOM, uh, you can't continue operating. What plans are in place for decommissioning and disposal of high-level waste? Still with ESCOM, the estimated cost of generation, including capital costs after the LTO project, after the life extension, what is, what is your estimated cost of generation at that point? Because we, we have no idea what you are, what, what you are, uh, budgeted or forecast in that regard. When last was a comprehensive seismic study conducted for Kuburg? And when it was conducted, did you use the Senior Seismic Hazard Analysis Committee methodology? If not, why not? And what methodology was used? Is the LTO safety case a public document? And if not, why not? 
Uh, why are the action steps in the LTO safety case after the time limited age analysis redacted in public documents? What what are you hiding by by redacting the the action steps? What about the LTO business case? Is that a public document? Has it been updated since 20, 2010? And if not, why not? We are 13 years down the line from 2010. A lot of assumptions have changed. A lot of costs have changed. Uh, so is there a new business case? Has it been updated? Has it been made public? Uh, and if not, why not? Can that business case be made available to this committee? And lastly, and this is to ESCOM, what contingency plans has ESCOM put in place for energy security should the NNR not grant an extension to Kuburg's operating license in July 2024? I'm assuming that there would be plans to, to continue with, with LTO work. You just wouldn't be able to operate. But what are you, what are you going to do about electricity security in that, in that scenario? Thank you, Chairperson. All right, Honorable McDougall. Um, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, greetings to the committee, um, the department, ESCOM. Um, condolences to your family as well, um, Chairperson. Um, I think some of the things that I'd wanted to ask I a bit covered, but my questions um, directly, I think, um, and uh, one is the one of the, the, the application that has been made, because I think every time we have this conversation about COVID, where the feedback is that the application has been made and there are processes that are underway. So one is interested in when exactly um, do we get to get feedback in terms of when the extension has been granted? You know, what is the timeline? in terms of when the final verdict on the application for the extension will be done. Um, the second question that I have, I recall that there has been, I think every time we have the conversation about waste, uh, specifically nuclear waste management in South Africa, um, there has been the issue that we do not have the infrastructure and that the infrastructure that we have is only for disposing of low level waste. So one is interested in what kind of waste um, Coburg has currently and how will it be disposed um, and how it's being disposed currently and how will it be disposed? Because the extension of the lifeline does not necessarily negate the fact that there has to be some disposal of waste. Um, and then the... Third question that I have, I think it would also be directed to both the department and ESCOM um, in terms of uh, we understand that there is an application or there is an attempt to um, extend the lifeline by 20 years. But what is the program post 2045? Um, is there a plans around that because, I mean, we're not only going to live or need electricity or nuclear generated electricity until 2045. So are there plans in place right now? Because for us to even have an issue of load shedding, it's because we started doing things at the very last minute as if we did not know that there would be a need for electricity, there would be a need for different sources of electricity as well. And the final question that I have, which is the fourth one, I think it is directed specifically to the department. Um, and it is directed about the questions of the legislation, because I know that at the beginning of the year, I'd say maybe around March, <clears throat> we did have feedback uh, from the department in terms of some of the very important legislation that needed to be completed. And we did get a commitment from the department that by, I think the 17th of April, the NNR amendment bill would be before cabinet um, and that the radioactive waste management fund bill would be before parliament by June, 2023. I do not, I think the date of April 17th has passed. Um, so one would really like to know what, what is happening there 
um, in terms of the commitment that was done by the department. And considering the fact that it's about a month before June 2023, do we have a guarantee that the second bill would have actually been processed? And some of the feedback or some of the questions that were made by the committee as well was the concerns around the fact that public hearings had not been sufficiently done um, and that some of the departments like Treasury had not been consulted or were not part of the compilation. So one is interested in terms of what the department has done in terms of taking into consideration those concerns that were made, uh, considering the fact that these two bills particularly do tie in with um, operations of Quebec and some of the things that will be done in terms of the extension of the life bank. Uh, thank you, Chair. Honorable Mara, Graham Mara. Thank you very much, Chairperson. And um, as, as per the previous speakers, I would like to offer my condolences. Days are going to be that you will find strength um, with your family. And I'd like to thank you for the welcome. I appreciate that. Um, it's it's a very daunting task to move on to a committee as technical as this when everybody's been doing this for four years. Can you hear me okay, Chair? Yes, yes. You okay. know, sorry, but, you, but we hear you very well. Though. Thank you. Yeah, I'm hotspotting off my phone and somebody phoned me. Um, all right, Chairperson. Um, just a couple of questions. In terms of the periodic safety review that ESKIM do, um, they do that every 10 years. Then they've done the safety aspects, the SALTO. Uh, I just wanted to know whether or not, given the fact that we're now extending the lifetime of, of the Kuburg Power Station, whether or not this is a once-off or if they will be looking at, I mean, there's always new developments, there's new technologies, et cetera, coming through. Would they look at doing a SALTO maybe 10 years on um, to determine whether or not they would extend by a further 10 years. Um, so that's my first question. Um, then also just in terms of the ESKIM presentation on slide 24 on the fourth bullet point, um, the sentence reads that ESKIM has submitted the LTO safety case to the NNR within the prescribed time limits to afford the NNR sufficient time for review. There are some outstanding commitments that, and the sentence doesn't finish. So I was just curious as to what those outstanding commitments relate to or what they wanted to say in terms of that. Um, and then um, Honorable Milam did cover me to a certain extent in terms of um, what happens if the, the, the license is not issued for the LTO by the NNR um, with respect to decommissioning. So my questions were, are there plans for supplementing the electricity that would be lost um, to the grid? And also, how long would it take to replace that lost power, given that they're only going to have about a year's worth of heads up, if that, that it's not going to proceed? Um, and then given the fears around nuclear um, that people generally have, the, the concerns about, um, you know, nuclear waste, um, nuclear fallout, et cetera, um, will the extra 20 years require more regular monitoring than has been done in the past? In other words, if you're monitoring every five years or every 10 years, you're doing the, um, the safety reports. Would you reduce the number of uh, the, the period during which you would do those? Um, would you have more intensive um, monitoring of the system? Or, um, you know, will it just carry on as though it has in the past? And if they are going to require more intensive monitoring and, and more regular um, reporting, are those plans already being developed? I think that's me for now. Thank you, Chairperson, for the opportunity. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, honorable members, with your questions. Now, honorable Mailem, just a, to share a joke with you. In the 80s, there was uh, one old man who used to go, they, they used to call it a personnel and um, say that uh, my father passed away, then uh, my mother passed away, my brother passed away. <coughs> And then one day when uh, he arrived at work, they gave him a letter of dismissal, very polite, that uh, please go home because uh, all members of your family, you registered, they have passed on. 
So we sympathize with you, go home. So I don't know, no, 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 it's not my father. My father passed away in 2018. It's one of the younger brothers to my father, the younger brother to my father who passed on. But you know by tradition, he's still my father. Uh, by virtue that uh, by lineage is a, is a younger brother to my father. So <clears throat> I don't want people to say, hey, this man in 2018 and his father passed away now, is coming back with another one. How many fathers does he have? Um, it's just on a lighter note, but thanks for, 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 for your words of uh, 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 condolences. Um, it's life. Uh, that's that's um, the final destination for all of us. It's sad that it's not an easy thing when it comes through. Uh, without any further um, uh, delays, can I? Uh, because uh, now we've got uh, the minister. I, I take that the teams are under your your jurisdiction for for just for today. You will see how do you split them, whether you, the department starts or you give ESCOM to start or you give NNR to start. But uh, I will only come up after you have given the answers, both the MRE, NNR, as well as ESCOM. Uh, uh, I'm not calling you in a, in a chronological manner. Can I give to the Honorable Minister and then uh, you will see how do you distribute your team in terms of responses. No, thank you, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, Comrade said, uh, Honorable Sir Elizabeth, your father's brother is called an uncle in English. Okay. Uh, That's what I said. You didn't say so. You said it's my, my father's brother. It's your uncle. Uh, Comrade said, please. <laughs> uh, give us details of how are you going to work because to us it's not only a question of giving you message of condolences it also make an effort to honor the funeral uh, to give us the details thank you very much okay let me come to the questions the IRP update is the rough um, uh, IRP framework has been completed. It's going to be open for discussion. Uh, we are late. When it is happen, end of March, it is now going to happen now. Uh, we are pushing very hard on it. It's IRP 2023 uh, from 20, uh, 2019. Uh, that is regular revision of IRP than any time before. So it will come, it's not out yet, uh, Honorable Mailam. My apology for this delay, but we're working on it. The, the second thing I want to, to caution ourselves about um, is negativity when we're expected to come positive and look forward to energy security. Uh, question about plans for decommissioning and nuclear waste, that's not what we're planning for. We're planning for the extension of life of Cooper by 20 years. That's what we're planning. So uh, the, the, the decommissioning of Cooper must be pushed out for another 20 years. And that will deal with all the issues, including nuclear waste. Uh, plan for new, more nuclear power. Uh, yes. You will know that we, we, we were working on request for proposal for 2,500 megawatts from nuclear. And sites have been identified. One very difficult is in Cuba, and the other one is in Pittsburgh, near to near Portland. And therefore, we're hoping that at a point we'll have more nuclear power around us. Let me, uh, the, the, let me talk about the fear of nuclear. Uh, France is generating electricity 75% from nuclear. It has no disasters. Uh, we have run uh, Cuba for 40 years with no disasters. Uh, the only disaster I remember about nuclear was the Chernobyl disaster. Uh, that is a disaster. And 
every other technology have had a number of disasters. So I don't think we must deal with nuclear out of fear. It is increasingly getting space in the energy supply. Uh, Europe has uh, identified it as part of the green transition together with gas, and that's our attitude in the department. But let me allow technical people to answer to the question. I was just answering the questions that are uh, almost political in outlook. Um, Bambo? Thank you, Honorable Minister and uh, the Honorable Chair and the uh, members of the committee. Uh, the Honorable Minister has dealt with uh, the outlook in terms of the plan for the nuclear program, so I will not deal with that. They are just like to uh, deal with the issue around the matters that were raised about the legislation as to what is the outlook. Uh, to the department. And uh, in terms of the NNR uh, amendment bill, uh, that bill has recently been uh, 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 presented to the, uh, the DG cluster uh, for approval for it to serve in cabinet. And uh, that's the work that the department is busy uh, uh, doing after it has uh, uh, been presented to cabinet. Uh, then the decision would then be after that it will then be for approval to serve in parliament. So, so the department is now working to take uh, the NNR bill to present it uh, to cabinet as, as it has been approved by the DG cluster. In terms of the fund bill, work is in progress uh, uh, the, as the honorable member has alluded to in terms of uh, addressing all the the concerns that were raised in terms of uh, the consultation with stakeholders and then to take the bill forward uh, for the department for it to be presented also following the same uh, approach as the, uh, the, 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 the the NNR bill for it to be presented to uh, cabinet uh, after it, it's been uh, looked into and amended to make sure that it deals with the issues in terms of taking away uh, the approach in which it was initially structured. I would like to then uh, end the uh, honorable minister, then the, most of the questions uh, the, were directed to the ESCOM and the NNR uh, with your permission, minister and the chair. Thank you. ESCOM. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Honorable Chair. If I can then invite Becky and the team from our generation side and Kubu side to then deal with the questions uh, ranging from matters around our safety case, the cost management, the projections, uh, around our application versus security supply. I think there's a matter around the seismic study, which probably is uh, a comprehensive question that is addressed to perhaps all of us uh, ministers as a collective. Um, and then the other themes of questions were around waste management and safe disposal. Um, and lastly, the slide 24 that was specifically cited. Um, and so, colleagues, if we can deal with those themes, uh, over to you, Don, uh, Zuida. Thanks, Joe. I'll continue. In terms of the question around the exact status of the safety case, the safety case has been compiled and submitted to the regulator for review. Um, so we have completed the document and it is currently under the review process from the uh, National Nuclear Regulator. Um, going on to the question around the costing of the project, the 
project budget was estimated at 20 billion rand. We are still within um, that projection that we, that we currently have um, of 20 billion rand. Um, we haven't moved significantly around that. The bulk of the costing associated with, with the project has already been incurred through the large modification work scope that has been expended. So over 70% of the cost is already We've lost your audio, Sadhguru, so please, can you attend to the audio? Uh, as come chair, is there loading at uh, Bergen Park? He's at Quebec, so I doubt. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Zuide, Sarika, please. They are sitting together at Quebec, uh, Honorable Chair. Looks like we've lost both of them. Uh, we can just give them a minute to, to rejoin. Okay. Thank you, Chair. I'm back. We are struggling with the audio. The audio system you're, you're using, Sadiq, is failing us. Uh, because you keep on fading away, I don't know what's going on there in your boardroom. My apologies for the check. Can the committee hear me clear now? It's better. If I just, if I just go, thank you. I'm just not going to touch any of the wiring <laughs> associated with my mic. Um, I was giving feedback that we are using the advanced check methodology of, to conduct the seismic hazard analysis work. Um, and that is a specific dispensation that we have followed. Um, it is the latest methodology that's in use. So just to confirm that um, we are using uh, that process and that work is on track um, to provide us the latest information around the suitability of Kuburg uh, to withstand the seismic event. And that information once completed will then impact further on the uh, information to be provided to, to, to the regulator around that. Uh, Chair, in terms of the Contingency plans as in place if the license is not granted, we, we will be following on with the uh, normal operating processes within the, the generation um, domain um, with the additional units that's on from the Duke in Sile. Um, the, the rest of generation will be required to pick up uh, the load if we are unsuccessful in the uh, extension of, of Kubuk. Uh, which may have other implications around the unavailability of, of the additional megawatts um, that, that we do have. It's very important for us that we do stabilize um, the, the system. And I think the long-term operation objective of, so to be successful for, for Kubik's operation is, is a key part to sustaining a security of supply uh, chain. Um, a key question that has been asked is around the, the waste management and how this is disposed of. We do have two types of waste um, on, on the site. Um, the low level waste is uh, being managed and transmitted through to the radioactive waste disposal um, facility in, in Valpits. Um, and uh, that follows the approved processes and these are being shipped on a regular basis from site to to, uh, to the Valpits, where that's disposed of. Uh, we are currently storing all our spent nuclear fuel on site. Um, and uh, these are skipped on site in the spent fuel storage pools, as well as in dry cask storing uh, facilities uh, or cask that is uh, specifically being sized and, and manufactured for us to store these on site. Um, what's important here is that uh, that fuel um, will be transported to the interim storage facility once that is completed um, by the uh, Narwadi uh, and uh, an appropriately licensed, we will start shipping our high level fuel over to the uh, very centralized interim storage facility um, for storage until the final decision around disposal, ultimate disposal of spent fuel uh, is made and uh, the policy imperatives will be followed in meeting those requirements, uh, Chair. Um, in terms of decommissioning, the question was asked, what's the status of decommission? We do have an approved decommissioning plan and strategy that has been approved, um, and these uh, items will come into play if the decision is made around uh, decommissioning of the facility. 
Um, it is quite closely linked to the decision around the program post 2045. I think what's important is at closer to the time before we reach the 2045 period, we will need to reevaluate uh, the plan and strategy of the plant um, and together with government decide on an appropriate strategy going forward. Uh, the current practice that we are observing in the industry worldwide is the fact that at the bulk of the uh, plants, especially in the US, are going beyond a 60 year operating life to 80 years. Um, we will need to evaluate uh, the suitability of our plant based on uh, the studies we would need to conduct if we have the appetite and the ability to progress beyond uh, 60 years to 80 years. Um, and that decision will be made uh, more appropriately closer to, to that time frame. Um, around that. The alternative to that would be then following through with the formal decommissioning procedures. Uh, Chair, a question was asked, and my apologies on slide 24 with the outstanding uh, statement that has been made. Um, the outstanding commitments um, that we need to complete prior to entering into uh, the RTO period is the work that we need to do. And these are the activities that um, I've mentioned. We are monitoring and providing regular feedback to both the NNR as well as the DMRE uh, through the dashboard that we have in place of all the outstanding actions and commitments that we have uh, to support the safety case and the commitments therein that needs to be made. Um, so that is the conclusion of that sentence. And, and I do have to apologize around not having completed that uh, that sentence, but it, it, it really spoke through to that. Um, just in terms of we're entering into the LTO, Chief, um, a question has been asked, what will the uh, operating and maintenance costs be? Those will be the normal costs that we currently incur in running Kuburg on, on a day-to-day -day basis. We are expecting that to continue into the LTO period as business as usual. The bulk of the CapEx spend is currently being expended to support the studies that's required to perform uh, the LTO and provide that safety case. Um, uh, what has happened is a lot of maintenance activities has been identified that we need to do, and these will now be uh, programmed into our maintenance program and our maintenance basis adjusted accordingly, um, as well as our aging management programs and the routine programs that we do have in place to, to manage the plant and the systems in place. So these will all um, are all collected into our normal maintenance costing, and we have not seen or projected a significant increase in the normal operating and maintenance costs to run the plant uh, going going forward. So that stays within uh, our current requirements around that. Yeah, Chair, just one comment that I think I can add. There was also a question, is Peggy speaking? There was also a question with regard to the 45 days delays, but that is only referring to the current outage. It doesn't have uh, the impact on the LTO extension. The impact is only currently now because it means then the unit is not going to be available to, to deliver power for the additional 45 days. But in terms of the life extension, it doesn't have any impact. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, Sadika, do you want to indulge the committee and honorable members and just talk a little bit about nuclear safety in terms of what makes you uh, wake up every morning and go and work at a nuclear plant um because there's there's, a, there's been a few themes around nuclear safety and how we dispose of waste material and the like but just a day in the life of a nuclear operator just briefly Actually, I, I certainly can 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 indulge the committee on that. It's uh, it's not a normal life. Um, um, we do have quite the challenges that we need to, to progress on the plant in managing the plant safely. Safety and nuclear safety for that is our utmost priority. Um, a lot of the decision making that we do do is around protecting the reactor core and making sure that we do not have any event that could lead to uh, the core becoming unstable and resulting in an accident of any kind. Um, a large part of our work really is focused around making sure that um, the three barriers um, are maintained on a constant basis. Um, and a lot of decision making is often centered around making sure that the fuel is protected um, as, the, the, as the core uh, system that contains the highly radioactive material um, that needs to be contained and well managed um, and uh, to not escape the plant. 
Um, that is also encased within the primary system um, that houses and really protects the uh, as the second barrier of, of the fuel. If anything should go wrong with the fuel, that it, it gets maintained within within the plant and in the primary system. And ultimately, if that is breached, that the containment system um, as our third barrier protects that. However, what is key for us is that we do manage these parameters quite, close, quite, quite closely. And what is different for us in, in these issues is uh, managing uh, the reactivity of and, and the science behind the reactor core um, to make sure that it stays within the margins and the design limitations that, that we do have. And all our procedures that we have in place is very important. It, it really takes a lot of the decision making up front and it has to be well thought through before it's documented and proven um, to, to run the plant safely. Um, and the, all the operators are trained to manage that. Our maintenance teams are specifically authorized to manage all these plant components. Uh, we do have an extensive monitoring program to ensure that they are fit in both mentally and physically to, to perform the, the duties safely um, and to protect the core. Ultimately, we do not want to be able to execute the emergency plan, and we do make provisions that we are trained everybody around emergency planning responsibilities to uh, mitigate any item that may come up if, 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 if that does materialize. Uh, it's almost like flight crews are trained to, to deal with uh, emergencies, and we hope we will never get into that space, uh, but we do rely on making sure that we have the best people trained and authorized to manage them, as well as the skill sets that needs to go with that. We have had perturbations around losing key staff, um, and so we're constantly training our staff to make sure uh, when we get new people in that they are able to function safely um, and follow our procedures. Uh, appropriately and all of these items are managed quite closely from and, and, and shared with the regulator who will license specific processes um, within within the plant and our operators uh, to give us that added uh, measure of safety we need to prove to the regulator um, whatever we do is safe um, and that is predicated around proving to ourselves that what we're doing is the right thing for for the plant and, and for the country uh, as a whole because one thing is for sure, we cannot afford a nuclear accident in, in the country, and we need to make sure we have the best people and resources available to support that uh, and, and operate the plant safely. Thank you, Chair, and thanks for the video. Thank you, Sadika and Becky. Um, Honourable Minister, Honourable Chair, we hope we've covered all the questions that were directed at us from an ESCOM point of view. In the in the unlikely event that missed a question will be guided by yourselves. Thank you very much. Okay, NNR. Thank you, Minister and Chairperson. I'll hand over to the CEO and her team to respond to our questions. But just before I do that, I'd, I'd like to follow up on the comment that has been made by ESCOM in as far as the commissioning is concerned. Uh, Honourable Member, I just want to, uh, you know, add that decommissioning is part of the routine, um, as part of the routine licensing process, is that when an applicant applies to the NNR for a nuclear installation, any type of nuclear installation of any kind, at commencement of the, of the project, they also have to demonstrate, just, or at least submit a plan, to the regulator about how they're going to decommission the facility whenever that happens. So that, that's, uh, that's quite routine. So the same thing would have applied to Quebec as well in, in that they would have had to provide a decommissioning plan at commencement um, of the plant. And my understanding is that initially that plan would evolve over time with the changing circumstances. Uh, for example, there are now issues that have arisen regarding spatial developments um, around the Dana Fontaine site. So that would obviously impact on issues of safety, including issues of evacuation. But, but decommissioning would have been a part of that um, early on. And, and the same thing would be the case now with, with the LTO. Uh, did I hope please you can take over with the team? Thanks. Um, thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, uh, members, for the questions. The, there was a question from Honorable Mylan. Um, about the status of um, 
the end date for unit two, just to indicate that um, we have received a request from ESCOM to decouple the operational um, timelines of the two units. And this request is currently being um, assessed by the NNR. I'd just like to point out that the decision you know, will be informed um, by the status of the common systems between the two units. And then there was a question from Honorable Madokwe about when, when is the timeline for a final decision on the, the LTO application. And what we indicated in the presentation um, was that we, we anticipate a decision by the board of the NNR in July, 2024. And, you know, that, that presupposes that uh, we will have received, you know, all of the outstanding submissions from ESCOM it, well in time to afford the regulator an opportunity to do a thorough review of those submissions. But by our current planning, we anticipate July 2024. Shepherds and all the other questions, they were either for ESCOM or for the department. Thank you. Thank you, Minister and Chairperson. I'll hand over to you again. Thank you. Uh, that is uh, uh, the end of our attempt to answer questions. Uh, but Honorable Chairperson, I want to emphasize this. We are here to discuss with the Portfolio Committee the extension of life of COVID. And we're expecting the Portfolio Committee in this oversight role to provide support for that program. We can't be preempting it by discussing decommissioning. I think it's putting the cut before the horse. Thank you. Over to you, Chairperson. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister and the, the team. Um, I see Honorable Malem wants to come with a follow up before I. Let me give him on a follow up or a question that has not been clarified before I make a proposal from the chair uh, on how to deal with this matter uh, going forward. Honorable Mylem. Uh, Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, Chairperson, let me just reassure the minister that, that uh, I am quite willing to support any program that brings energy and electricity security to South Africa. However, we would be remiss in our duties as members of parliament in our oversight role if we did not consider all the scenarios that are, uh, that are possible. And one of those is that there may be a need for decommissioning. So the question was, is there a contingency plan for decommissioning? And, and I didn't get a clear answer on that. It's not, it's not that we are being negative about anything. It's, it's thinking ahead and looking what happens if. Chairperson, my, a couple of my other questions were, were not answered completely. And um, I'd, I'd like to highlight them. The first one that, that I want to highlight is I asked, what is the estimated cost of generation, including capital costs after the life extension project? In other words, what are we going? What is ESCOM going to 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 charge for electricity? What what is it going to cost them to produce a kilowatt hour of electricity at Kuburg after the life extension uh, project? And and we can't say well the maintenance cost and opex costs are going to be the same, um, but the capital costs we, we've got twenty billion rands worth of capital costs that we have to factor in. So I'd like an, a clear answer as to what the estimated cost of generation will be. The second question that I didn't get a clear answer to was I, I heard uh, Mr. Phillips say that they used the SHAC methodology in their assessment, but my question was specifically when last was a comprehensive seismic study conducted for Kuburg? Didn't get an answer to that one. Then I asked about the business case document and whether it had been updated since 2010. Nobody answered that, and I didn't get an answer as to whether or not that business case could be made available to this committee. And lastly, the LTO safety case, is that a public document? And if not, why not? 
Thank you, Chair. Honourable Chairperson. Ish, you know him to a certain from us. Um, yes. I am I'm, I'm speaking only to find out I'm, I've muted myself. <laughs> no, so when I was talking to myself, I was saying, let me go back to 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 the minister and the team, especially specifically, I think it's ESCOM, uh, where there's been no clarity. Um, then I want to make a suggestion and see whether we'll get the support of the of the committee, which I think it we it is a progressive one, and 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 therefore we take it from there. Um, probably it might be aligned to what you are raising, Honourable Minister, on the role of the committee, having been briefed now and being aware of what is actually taking place. That that that's what that. Um, proposal from me will be coming from. But let me give it to you, Honorable Minister, for also your team to deal with also the outstanding questions that uh, have been raised. Uh, I will allow uh, ESCOM and NENA to come to, to respond to questions. But the first question that the commissioning was not answered. I heard the chairperson of NNR say, decommissioning is part of every licensing application. And therefore, there is inherently a decommissioning plan in running a nuclear power station. But that is not for me to answer. I'm not a nuclear scientist. I'm ending over to NNR and ESCO. Thank you, Minister. This is the NNR chairperson again. You are correct, Minister, in the in what you just said now, that that is exactly the response that I gave. And it was also a follow-up to the response that ESCOM had given about the fact that they do have a decommissioning plan in place. And, um, and in as far as the question about the seismic study is concerned, Orion, can you please respond to the honorable member about when was the last study that was performed? And if there's any other question, I think that's due to us, please respond to that as well while you still have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. I will attempt to answer the questions. Um, with regard to the question on the seismic study, uh, one has to go back and look at the responsibility to, to do the study. So this responsibility is vested with ESCOM to ensure that they provide the full extent and scope and methodology to do the study. Um, so the, the NNR acknowledges the shock, the SHAC methodology. This is a proven methodology that interrogates um, seismic safety. And um, ESCOM really needs to also respond because we have received an interim a strategy from ESCOM on seismic safety. At the moment, we are reviewing um, SHAC's uh, seismic studies that are being um, submitted to the regulator from ESCOM. But I think the question really here is for ESCOM to, to respond to that. I just want to talk to the other questions that uh, we may have missed. Um, I think on the safety case, we've mentioned the safety case is a, is a public document. We've made it available on our website. We've given it to all our stakeholders. So the, the safety case is available. I do acknowledge the concern that uh, the members are speaking in terms of the redacted safety case. Um, the NNR adopted this approach to ensure that security information is not in the safety case. All the essential elements of the safety case are there, but for the security information, which should not be, um, which are sensitive information. So that is the position on the safety case. Then just to answer one more question about um, Honorable Member Marie mentioned what will happen in terms of um, after the uh, July 24 
they will be regular monitoring by the NNR on the, uh, the maintenance activities, um, the condition of the components on, the, on the, the, we will then shift focus to ensuring that the aging management plans are implemented and we will continue to investigate and monitor any effects um, that may have been identified in the uh, in the, the process where we did the aging management identification. I think I've tried to cover the questions um, and I will hand over back to the chairperson of this year. Thank you. Thank you, Arana. I think that and God, Honourable Minister. Thank you. Um, the two questions that uh, were cited by Honourable Mailam uh, that we perhaps may not have answered as comprehensively as may have been desired. The first one relates to where the estimated cost of uh, Quebec versus our overall generation uh, operating costs can be articulated. Um, I would like to humbly request that uh, it has been answered at high level, but humbly request you, Honourable Chair, that perhaps we can revert in writing uh, on the breakdown thereof, because uh, I, I, th I think the question speaks to our capital management program with regards to generations at Kuberg. Uh, to the extent that it's acceptable, uh, may I request that? And then secondly, on the LTO business case, I, I heard my colleagues uh, responding to it, but to the extent that perhaps we may not be as detailed as desirable, we may be guided on what further detail we need to provide when we respond in writing. If, if that's acceptable, Honourable Minister and Honourable Chairperson. Thank you. Back to you, Honorable oh, thank you, thank you, Honorable Minister. Uh, Honorable members, can I make this proposal? Surely, when we request that both the department, ESCOM, and um, and uh, NNR, um, it was uh, about uh, how do we plug in in those processes and uh, objectively make our own. Um, assessment and proposals as, as a way of um, a contributing towards what we think will be a conducive outcome in relation to the life extension um, of Quebec. Can I request that um, <clears throat> both Sivu, uh, I hope you are in the meeting, and um, Mashudu, from a research point of view, having had these two inputs, I want to say two, but obviously there were three, uh, especially the one from ESCOM and uh, NNR, can you put together uh, what's, uh, what's your take? And then uh, we prepare for a discussion within the committee and um, what then we want to suggest as recommendations uh, that needs to be to be to to be undertaken, including the sub the type of support or interventions that will be required. Can we can we agree on that? I'm giving you, if I know you are quite hectic with other programs. Can I give you and my to probably at least uh, in a period of two weeks? be able to bring that uh, back to the attention and then we'll see when do we schedule the, the that meeting. It would even be under the, the period of uh, advancing on, on, on where we are now in terms of the program of the today's committee, which means even if it falls under, under matters arising as a deliberation, uh, of the committee and be able to make it uh, its, uh, on its own uh, the, uh, 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 outcomes. 
so that we've got a way of closure uh, on the on the item because in most cases we discuss and discuss and ask questions and that's the end we don't see ourselves now as um, public representatives what are we saying what the what is our take what do we think could uh, could help to augment that process so i, I would ask i uh, uh, Sivu and Mashudu to help us on that. Is that, is that uh, I will take that if there is no objection, there is, a, there is sufficient consensus uh, that that would be the process, the process that will follow. Do we agree, honorable members? I get there's no objection to that. They agreed. Uh, that, okay. <laughs> that, yes, that is a uh, yeah. yes, honorable madam. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I agree 100% with you. Um, could I just ask that that business case be included in the in the documentation? Thank you, Chair. That's fine. They will have to collect any and every information that will help the, com the committee to uh, to be much more uh, uh, knowledgeable and also make informed decisions or recommendations. Uh, that 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 will be done. Okay. On that note, Honourable Minister. Uh, you will bear with me, chairpersons of NNR and ESCOM. Uh, 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 <coughs> Sometimes we are trying to note that advantage of our own dollar apart. Can I give to the to the honourable minister on his last words? Not that you are not that you are dying when I say your last words, please. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm not about to die, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, not with the fresh company of members like Honorable Melam and Honorable Matoka. I can't die now. It's, it will be a wrong time to die. Thank you very much for listening to us, interrogating us, asking questions, asking difficult questions. In the process, we're also learning and, and we appreciate that. Um, uh, this is one area where uh, we, we work together with all these uh, key players in the process. But we always know that the power station is an ESCOM power station. We don't pretend to be anything else. It's not a half power ESCOM, it is ESCOM power station. Uh, but we must play our role, sub be supportive of what ESCOM tried to do nudge them where we need to nudge them. And then are exercising its uh, responsibility as a regulator uh, and, and, and continue uh, regulating and providing support. Thank you very much for, the, for this session. Uh, I'm sure we will call us for a follow-up uh, session in the not distant future, if I know uh, the committee as I know it now. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Minister. Um, I think your dedication is now released um, to get you know, in, in, its, in its totality. But as you know, you can't dismiss anyone from um, observing the proceedings of the committee, but I'm sure we're done now. Can we go to the minutes, Ari? Thank you very much, Chair. Oh, is it is the program, Ari, isn't it? Yeah. Exactly, Chair. Let's do the programs, the remainder of the second term, and then the third term, and then we can yes. do the minutes, Chair. Yes. Just do them both. Okay, Chair. Thank you, Chair. So this is the program for the remainder of the second term for 2023. So we've done, we've just done the meeting now for the 9th of May, uh, briefing by DMRE, ESCOM and NNR on the Kubus nuclear power plants uh, long-term operations. Then this coming weekend, we have the public hearings on the UPRD in Nkumalanga, which has been rescheduled. 
Um, we were going to have initially a meeting on the 12th, this coming Friday, but that has been rescheduled to Tuesday the 23rd, Chair. So uh, this coming weekend, public hearings in Pumalanga. And then the following week, um, the 16th is the uh, budget vote for the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy Chair. So therefore, and that is scheduled for the morning from 10 to 12.30. So therefore, we don't have any meetings for next week. But we're continuing but with the... Once, once, once you're still there, I, re, I think it will be necessary for the, hmm. sake, of, for the sake of recording yeah. that is included in the program. So that down, oh. the, line, down, the, okay. line you are, down the line, when you are asked, at least somebody will know why for the whole week there was no committee meeting. That's fine, Chair. Yeah. So, yeah, 19 to 21, we continue with the public hearings in the Northwest on the UPRD. And then, as I say, Tuesday the 23rd, uh, briefing by the DMRE on the third and fourth quarterly performance reports for 22-23. Then, that week on the 26th to the 28th, we continue with the last leg of the uh, upstream petroleum resources development bill in the Gauteng province. Then on Tuesday, the 30th of May, we have a number of items, update on the sale gas developments, update on the solar water heater storage, update on the cadastral system, and update on the licensing backlog. Then the last one, the Envisage International Study Tour to Norway, 5 to 17 June. We haven't scheduled anything for that Friday um, because uh, members, if, if approved, the International Study Tour uh, members will be moving, uh, leaving for Norway that Saturday, Chair. So that's the program for the remainder of the second term, Chair. Let me just continue with the third term. Yeah. Now, the constituency period after the second term, say, is running from 19 June to, uh, what is it, 30 August. So it's about 10 weeks, the constituency period. Then. The National Assembly will resume its activities on the 5th of September. Now, the, the third term is only three weeks, from 5 September to 23 September. And what we've done, Chair, we've, we've only, we, we will only be dealing with the Upstream Petroleum Resources Development Bill, uh, the processing thereof. So on Tuesday the 5th, when members come back, we will consider and adopt the Provincial Public Hearings Report on the UPRD. Friday the 8th, we'll start with deliberations on the bill. Tuesday the 12th, deliberations on the bill. Friday 15th, deliberations. Tuesday 19th, close by close. Uh, and then Friday the 22nd, consideration and adoption of the committee report on the UPRD. Um, yeah, so then the constituency period starts from the 26th of September to the 9th of October 2023. So those are the programs for the second term remainder and the third term. Okay. Thanks, sir. Okay, thank you very much. I'm trying to check is there any contribution? One thing that other members, my, uh, my request and appeal, we'll have to go back. We, we have already dealt with the program. But uh, I'm looking now Ari, with, uh, with hindsight. We may have to look at, uh, just from an experience point of view, how long does it take in the committee to get presentation on the quarterly reports? And in my view, we may have to put one of those items, if not two, when we deal with the quarterly report. I'm looking at uh, shale gas is not something that we can do and finish within um, 30 minutes, I don't see it. Secondly, when you look at the at the 
solar water heater storage or solar water heater program. I prefer to use that word. Solar water heater program is not something that you can do and finish with it. In fact, it may even drag to more than an hour. And then uh, the license card start system and the backlog, because those are two different things, may also take its own time. So we may have to consider uh, if members allow us to go back and look at which ones can we put together with the third and fourth quarterly report by the department. And then uh, if members allow us to do it, can we get a move off the program with that possible um, flexibility? Um, it's not a move per se, Chair, rather a question that I wanted to pose and perhaps get guidance on. And then after that, maybe we can then speak on the program itself on moving for it, Chair, if you allow. Yes. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I think it's just a, if, a question rather because um, I think the third quarter is basically like as you explained here, it's roughly like three weeks and it's basically towards the end of the year as well. But my question was on, I remember we had a meeting around February where we were dealing with correspondences uh, from different organizations and different people who were not um, getting, or who were not, yeah, who, whose issues were not getting resolved at the pace that they were getting resolved on. Um, I think there was uh, one that is off the top of my head was the sort corps sea salt issue. And I think there was a Aura Bulana issue as well and all these other issues which during that meeting we then said that, look, some of these things would incorporate um, as we are doing the public hearings so that we can sort of get an understanding of what exactly is happening and how we're going to intervene. I remember as well when we're doing the illegal mining oversight last year and we had raised or we had observed some issues. I think it was Northwest in particular where I was in where we felt that there were a lot of issues that the committee needed to go back towards. And I think also there was an issue of Jachas Fundin as well, where we said that we needed to go back as the committee within an X amount of time. Um, and I see that and we're not necessarily going back in terms of checking that the commitments that we do ourselves as the portfolio committee, we do see them through. And also some of the things that have been brought to our attention that look, we've been trying to get a resolution from the department, nothing is happening. So we're asking for your depart for your intervention as the portfolio committee. I do not think that we have done thorough justice in terms of resolving some of these issues, which I feel are very important. Um, and I just wanted to check where do they fall in, in the bigger scope of things, considering the fact that the timeline is also not to our um, advantage, but also at the same time, it's issues that as a portfolio committee, we are obliged to address. Thanks, Chair. So the end of Honorable Mylan. Chairperson, I've raised this before, but I, I, I don't see anything being done about the Electricity Regulation Act, which is of critical importance given the crisis in electricity in our country. Uh, and I do think we need to build it into the schedule in the third term at the very least. Thank you, Chair. I, I think I can answer. I hope I can, they can help. I can answer the last one. I, I've not seen, as soon as the act is presented, unfortunately, that's what the rules of, but maybe I can help in iron. But the procedure is simple. As soon as the bill is referred to the committee, uh, uh, we will we then have no option but to table it in the committee. And that's where my worry is, and my worry was even on the previous uh, matter, because um, in one of the meetings where we were, I've been corrected in the, in, the, in, the, in the management committee meeting when I said there was a view that says um, any bill that will not be finished by September uh, it is in by July, next September, that bill will no longer be relevant because the NCOP is not going to accept it. 
Um, maybe Ari can help us. Whether what is your under understanding and I under on the on the on the on the uh, on what Honorable Mailem is talking about. The issue, Honorable Mato, uh, you are correct. Uh, remember, we to do uh, Swarkops, and uh, at that time, the the the, the person was declared uh, that they is in hospital. And uh, we then had to look for an alternative time in Port Elizabeth. We had enough time because we were going to be based in PE. We, the problem now that you are having in most of these areas where you require oversight or you require uh, activities is that when you look at the distances, immediately you finish in one area. You have to move, for instance, let's take Pumalang, I'm not saying, which we don't have an issue that I remember Pumalang. When you finish pushback reads, you have to drive to, to, to Middleburg. If you had an issue to attend to admit in Middleburg, by the time you arrive, it's almost four to five to five to five o'clock. Equally from Middleburg, you have to move to Seconda. So some of these areas, we are looking at them, whether it practically it is possible to deal with them. Linked to this also was the issue that relates to the oversight. There is something called committee week or something like that. Now, when you look at the, put it simple and straightforward, when you look at the third quarter, let's be honest, the problem with the third quarter is that there is no third quarter, if truth be told. It's only five from the fifth up until to the 23rd. Né? And in that period, the only thing that you need to concentrate on is finalization of the bill, which is what the only thing that we could, we could fit in. And I think I share the concerns that you say. I better put it better, uh, put, I better put it by my, my view, uh, rather different from what uh, Ari was saying. 10 weeks sounds like something that is a tournament. We are going to have two months and uh, two weeks, if I'm not mistaken, two months and two weeks without doing uh, being part of parliament. That's what the program says, which makes it now very difficult to talk about where do we locate the work that has to be done, except what is actually regulated. Amongst other things that you are raising, you will recall when we're doing, um, what is this thing? When we're doing, dealing with the uh, joint um, meeting, joint oversight on illegal mining, Northwest was one of the areas that were highlighted on a need to do a revisit. Uh, the second quarter was just a review of items we agreed. So it's not something new. It was a review of something that we agreed. The problem with the third quarter is that there is nothing, except I can, I can assure you, if you look, beside what is being proposed now, it is very impossible and impractical to say there is something else that, that, that can be. Knowing though that parliament can review its work at any given moment, we will have to take those issues into consideration. Or we, we can't locate anything now because of the time, the time, frame, time factor uh, of being called a constituency period. So they will not be granted permission during constituency period to do work. But if space were to happen, we may have to consider those areas. If the committee allows us, consider those areas uh, maybe to do that work over the weekends. I can go back with the staff and look whether even that constituency period means that uh, we cannot do work. If you look again here, it's difficult to locate what we just agreed upon, that looking at the briefing of the entities and the department, we have not done justice as far as uh, the budgets and the APPs are concerned. We need to do extensive work, which is supposed to be high priority in this committee. Unfortunately, when you look at the program, it actually means if we were to be able to do that, we have to prepare comprehensively that it is located just before we deal with the PRRs. Is that possible? We will have to see when we go for the fourth quarter, whether that is possible. Because in the fourth quarter, the first issue that will be high priority is going to be the PRRs. That is, that is where the dilemma is, is getting a space 
where we can be able to locate, to allocate these the, particular demands. But it's not that they are lost and, and are on, out of out, out of hand. It's not that for me, I'll put it crudely, we don't have any third quarter leeway, if, if, if truth be told. And at, that, at the time where even myself, I was quite convinced that we will get a, a third quarter arrangement because the way I used to understand sometimes the third quarter, it is always linked to school um, intervals uh, or holidays. But now it's, uh, it's, it's, it's beyond what I've experienced before. But Aryan, Ayanda, do you want to add anything on that? Yeah, just quickly, Chase, just on the on the era bill, um, we've inquired from the, the, the Office of Legislation, uh, Mr. Neil Bell, with regard to the tabling of the era, but he's indicated that there's nothing yet. So um, with regard to the era bill, our trigger is that it has been tabled and that is that it is referred to the committee. But up until now, nothing chair. Then with regard to the, the deadlines, Chair, we'll have to get those uh, dates of submission of legislation uh, from the office. Uh, we'll get that and forward that through to members as well, Chair, for the information. So that is, yeah, my contribution, Chair. I don't know if Ian, Ayanna wants to add anything. Uh, no, Chair, Ari, you have uh, captured it all. I don't have anything to add. Thank you. Okay, Sivu. Uh, yeah, good, good, good morning, honorable members. I just wanted to emphasize a point that you made, Chair, about the third term and deliberations on the bill. I just want to alert members that the third, we can, the committee cannot do anything else other than the bill uh, in the third term. Uh, and even the three weeks to deal with the bill, uh, it's short. It's something that members also need to uh, bear in mind or discuss uh, somehow. I, uh, yeah, it's gonna be tough uh, doing uh, the bill and finishing it uh, in three weeks. So there's a bit of impracticality there. Thanks, sir. So you give an answer. Okay, I remember, like we said, we, we will see if, if there's any space that uh, is opening, uh, we, will, we, will, we will act on that. If there are certain things that we can do in the meantime and come and account into the committee, we'll exactly do that. <clears throat> can I get a mover now of the, of the program? Yes, we'll Yes, Chairperson. Oh. Okay, Honorable Mashaule and Honorable Jobe Gamakeke. Yes, Chair. Thank you, uh, Chairperson, Honorable Luzipo, and Honorable Minister, Honorable Members, officials uh, of the department, and all officials of uh, various entities present. I would like to move for the adoption of the program with the amendments, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, can we go to the minutes? Just give me a minute, Chair. Sorry, Chair, does it mean Mr. Marshall has second the adoption of amendments? Yes, yes, yes. But we must give him, we must hear him say it. Honorable Marshall, Chair, I second. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's a silent way of disciplining someone, but it's okay. The minutes of 14 March, yeah. 14 March, okay. Let's go to do, 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 do. opening on the presentations. Um, 
Yeah, continue. Chair, can we go to the, to the register? Let's go up register. Yes, Honorable Mashala. Hey, I don't remember apologizing, Chair. But it's fine. Uh, sorry, Chair, we've got the records, Mr. Mashaule. You did apologize. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Until you are sure, Honorable Masaule, <clears throat> uh, for now the records will remain as such. Uh, yes, can you continue on discussions? Okay. Uh, is there any mover of the minutes? Chair, I move for the adoption of the minutes. Any second, huh? Again, Chair. Thank you very much. Any matters arising? None. Let's go to the next set of minutes. Eighteen April, Chair. Yes. Yes. Okay, any more of the minutes of the 18th of April? I will go one. I move, Chair. But was I present? <laughs> you were present. You were present. No, it's just a joke. I, I second because Honorable Volmaranz has already moved here. Okay. Uh, I don't think because there's nothing there that is discussed. Can we go to the minutes? Can't be matters arising. Can we go to the minutes of... Uh, 19 April, Chair. 19 April. Again, it's the APP, Chair. Yeah, you may, I... Okay, any more for the minutes of the 19th, April? Sorry, Chair. Could we, just, could we just go back to the attendance, please? Okay. Uh, scroll down a little. Oh, sorry, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Any mover? I do move, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Von Maran. Send the second. Huh? I second, I uh, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Joe Gamakeke. I can't, there can't be matters arising. Can we go to the next set of minutes? Second of May, Chair. May 2. Let's go. Yeah.
Okay, is there any move of the minutes? I move for the adoption of the minutes, uh, Chairperson, as the true reflection of what transpired in that meeting. Thank you. Okay, any second? Thank you, Honorable Any second? Seconded, Chair. Thank you, VT. Okay, any matters arising, honorable members? Okay, can we go to the next set of minutes? That's it, Chair. Is that it? Yes, Chair. Okay. Um, nothing else. Can we then, uh, will I be appropriate to declare the meeting agent? Is there any other item? No. We, no because okay. the Honorable members, thank you very much. And uh, also your, your support. Thank you very much. Uh, the meeting stands adjourned. Thank you, uh, Chairperson, but keep us posted about recording day. general no. arrangements as the minister has alluded to that it must not just end up there. You must keep us posted. Thank you. And uh, we are with you in, in, in our prayers. My Chairperson, I don't like it. <laughs> okay, thank but you very much.